Hi everyone, it's Denise with In Liquid Color and welcome to today's Watercolor Wednesday. I have a special review for you today for some handmade watercolors from Pfeiffer Art Supply. Pfeiffer Art Supply creates handmade, non-toxic artist watercolors and custom travel tins. They use organic honey and gum arabic along with their pigments to create beautiful pans of paint. These are not paints that you'll find in art stores or other larger online retailers. They do have an online shop, both on their website and on Etsy, and I'll put links in the description below. The pigments are all molded by hand on a glass slab and then hand poured into their pans. Each pan takes about a week from start to finish to create and no two will ever look alike. Each color is named after a different bird, which I also find adorable. You can purchase each pan separately for $6 for half pans and $12 for full pans, which makes them the most affordable handmade watercolor I've ever seen on the market. Most handmade watercolors retail for $9 per half pan. They also strive to provide watercolors that are good for traveling, and they offer a wide range of tins with pre-selected colors or fully customizable palettes. Every tin comes with a water brush, and the tins arrive with individually wrapped pans, each of which has a small magnet for securing it onto the tin. I contacted Jen at Pfeiffer Art Supply after seeing their paints on Instagram and asked them if they would be interested in me reviewing their paints here on YouTube. I enjoy working particularly with other artists and small businesses, and better yet, her company focuses on eco-friendly business practices, which I was also hooked on. She kindly and graciously offered to send me a set of 12 half pans for review for this video in which she let me pick the colors for. Here's the color chart of the current line of paints as of January 2017. The colors in my palette that I chose are Nightingale Natural Red, Falcon Red Ochre, Goldfinch Yellow Ochre, Heron Gray Ochre, Kingfisher Red Lacquer, Cardinal Red, Yellow Bill Lemon Yellow, Toddy Green, Tanager Turquoise, Babbler Blue, Wood Nymph Blue, and Poulet Purple. At the time, I didn't know that Wood Nymph Blue had been sold out and discontinued, but a replacement color is coming very soon. Had I known, I would have chosen either Magpie or Macaw to show you. However, you can see them here in the chart, and they are Thalo Blue and Ultramarine Blue, respectively. Before we jump into the comparison part of the review, I wanted to show you a time-lapse painting of a lilac-breasted roller. However, my phone decided to cut out on me while I was recording, so I only have the first half of it. I'm going to follow it up with a picture, though, so that you can see the final piece of work. So now we're going to take a look at the Pfeiffer watercolors next to other brands. It's important to remember that these aren't necessarily in the same um, comparison range as other brands. When you make paints within a factory, um, there's a lot more consistency that goes into each individual batch. One of the charming characteristics of handmade watercolors is that each batch may be a little bit different, and uh, for the most part, I believe, uh, from what I've seen, that most paints are going to be more granular because you are, in fact, mixing them by hand. So even though we're comparing these to professional watercolors, I am doing it so that you guys can see the comparison between colors, not necessarily compare them side by side. Alright, so the first color that we have up here is Nightingale Natural Red. It's made from Pigment Art 102, which is, I believe, pretty close to a Venetian Red. Now, I don't have much Venetian Red because it's not a color that I typically use. Um, so the closest comparisons that I have is that it's somewhere between a transparent brown oxide from Daniel Smith and a... Uh, Mission Gold Red Brown. If you put it directly next to the brown oxide, it looks more brown, but then if you move it next to the red brown, it takes on more red characteristics. Um, it is a very granular pigment, and there is a large color shift from wet to dry on here. Let me go ahead and show you 
Uh, I'm not going to do this for every color, but this color in particular had a pretty big shift. So just so that you know when you are painting it, it's going to go from a much redder color to a deeper, uh, flatter brown. I'm going to show you my Daniel Smith 238 color chart here, and I don't have either of these colors to show you a better swatch, but I do think that they're very close to the Venetian red or the Indian red. All right, this is the Falcon Red Ochre, and this is actually a mix of pigments. It's from three different pigments, PY43, PR102, and PBK11, which means it does have black in it. Um, it's tonally very similar to Daniel Smith's Burnt Sienna, but it's a little bit more orange. However, it has the kind of characteristics and textures of the Van Gogh's Burnt Sienna, which also has black in it, so I thought it was a good comparison here. If I look at my Daniel Smith color chart here, I'd have to say it's probably pretty close to the English Red Ochre family. Um, all of these swatches on this chart are lighter than they would be out of the tube because they come from little tiny dots of paint that are on a piece of paper, so keep that in mind as well. But I think it's very close to uh, this Red Ochre color. Next up, we've got the Goldfinch Yellow Ochre. This is made from PY43. Um, traditionally, Yellow Ochre is made from PY42, but the colors are very, very similar. It has the same tone as the Daniel Smith's Yellow Ochre, but it's less granular, um, and texturally, it's more like the Schmincke's Yellow Ochre. So next up, I have the Heron Gray Ochre, and the Heron Gray Ochre is a beautiful kind of medium gray tone, and you can't really get it dark unless you do more than one coat. So if you do build up the color, it can get a lot darker, similar to the Schmincke's Ivory Black. And I did have one other uh, handmade watercolor black in my collection. This is Vine Black from Redwood Willow. The Vine Black is definitely um, more of a black pigment, and it's much, much more granular. I prefer the Pfeiffer Art because of, I just like the smooth quality of the Heron Gray Ochre. Next up we have Kingfisher Red Lacquer, and this is a beautiful color. It's not a color that I own in any other brand. Um, the closest that I have to it is the Van Gogh Permanent Red Violet and the Mission Gold Red Violet. Um, you can tell that these are both brighter, uh, more vibrant colors, but this has a really nice subtlety that I really enjoy. Um, I do have my Daniel Smith color chart here, and it's very close to a Bordeaux or a Quinacridone Violet. Next up we have Cardinal Red, and I think it's a very interesting color. Um, it's similar in tone to my Permanent Carmine from Schmincke and um, my Mission Gold Rose Matter, but it granulates um, tremendously. Like, I've never seen a red granulate like this, and it reminded me of the only red that I have seen that granulates like this is uh, Daniel Smith's Mayan Red. Now the Mayan Red is more orange than the Cardinal Red is, but it's the only other one that I have seen with this very granular property. So I have this Yellow Bill Lemon Yellow, and I honestly, it's it's not a color I enjoy at all. Um, it's the most negative thing I have to say about this entire kit, and I apologize for that, but it's not lemon yellow, it's not bright, it's not vibrant. Um, the closest comparison that I have of any yellow, I picked my least vibrant, most opaque watercolor, and that's my cadmium yellow pale hue from Cotman, and it's still so much more vibrant than this color is. Even after two, uh, just two coats, um, it's super, super thick. It, I think it's almost like a gouache. I don't have a lot of experience with gouache, but I mean, it's, it's not light and airy, and it's nothing like I think of a watercolor bean. I did spec that when I was picking out the colors that I wanted to try out, that this yellow was not going to be my favorite. However, I did want a yellow for my palette since it was offered, and the other closest one was the yellow ochre, or the, um, she has a sand grouse yellow ochre light as well, um, but it wasn't a yellow yellow. So I got this one just to try it out. It doesn't make oranges, it doesn't make greens. It's just a color that I don't think I'm gonna find myself ever wanting to use. I do have on my Daniel Smith color chart here, I think it's closest to the nickel titanium yellow, which is a very light, opaque color. All right, now we're gonna go from what I think is the weakest color in the line to my absolute favorite color in the line. I have never seen a green this shade, and it is gorgeous. I love, 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 love this green. Um, the closest comparison I have is a hooker's green from Mission Gold that's made from three different pigments. If I'm reading her color pigments right, it's only a single pigment, it's made from PG-8. And I'm not sure how that's possible because I've never seen it in another brand, but it's gorgeous and I love it. 
If we take a look at the Daniel Smith color chart, there is absolutely no comparison. Out of 238 colors, Daniel Smith does not have a color that comes close to this one. And I love it, and as long as she keeps making it, I will keep buying it. This color is gorgeous. All right, next is uh, Tanager Turquoise, and this is a beautiful color. I do not own any colors that come... Well, I guess they kind of come close, but not really. Um, the closest tone I think I have is Cotman's Viridian Hue, which is a, a pale bluish green color. But it's this one is very transparent, whereas the turquoise is pretty opaque. Um, here is it next to my Daniel Smith Cobalt Teal Blue Stick, which has the opacity, but this is obviously much, much bluer. It has a very mineral-like uh, quality when it dries. It doesn't really look like traditional granulation. It looks like little rock shelves. It's really All right, we're going to be taking a look at four different colors side by side here. Two of the colors are from Five for Art. We've got Babbler Blue and Wood Nymph Blue, and I didn't know when I purchased them that they're actually made from the same pigment, which is PB27. is Prussian Blue. So the only difference is that Babbler Blue has white pigment added to it, and the Wood Nymph Blue doesn't, but it makes a very large difference in the texture of the paint quality. So the Babbler Blue is more opaque, but it has a very smooth quality to it, whereas the Wood Nymph Blue is very, very granular. I have two other Prussian Blues, one from Mission Gold and one from Schmincke. Oops, I have these backwards. I would say that the Babbler Blue is closer to the Schmincke and the Wood Nymph Blue is closer to the Mission Gold variety. All right, my other favorite color from this set, other than the Toddy Green, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention earlier that it's called Toddy Green, is this Poulet Purple Violet. Now, I'm not sure why it's called Poulet, that's a cut of chicken, um, and it's not purple, unless I'm missing something. I couldn't couldn't find any bird reference um, for the purple color. I don't care, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's light, it's beautiful, it has a nice um, warm undertone. It's much, um, it's much warmer than a di dioxazine violet or a Windsor violet which is PV23. Um, it's the closest comparison I have is the Kurataki Purple, but I still prefer the uh, Poulet Purple from Pfeiffer Art. It's made from two different pigments, both PV23, which is the dioxazine violet, as well as PV19, uh, which is um, either quinacridone rose or quinacridone violet as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do some swatching for you here, just so you can see the colors kind of in action. They are a bit difficult to re-wet due to the fact that they are handmade mineral-based pigments. Um, they do have honey added to them, but I don't find these to act like other pigments that have honey added to them. So I'm just dropping a little bit of water onto each one. First, let's go ahead and take a look at that yellow that I was a bit critical of, and I'll show you kind of why I don't find it to be a useful color. I guess on its own it would be okay if you just wanted to use it on its own, but if I go ahead and swatch it down here, this is Arches Paper. And I mix in a red to it. It gets muddy really fast and it makes like a peachy color rather than an orange. If I take that same pigment and mix it with the blue, and I'm going to go ahead and take the blue that does not have white in it so that I'm not making it more opaque than it already is. It makes kind of like a tealish color, um, but it's it's an opaque teal and it's it's not a vibrant green. So if I didn't have my toddy green in the kit, I would not be able to make green using this yellow. Um, you might have noticed that some of the colors, like the one here, have incredible flow. I'm not sure if she adds oxgall to her paints or if she has a different or if she has a different additive that makes them do this. The Poulet Purple is one of the best examples of this. It spreads out so much when you, when you touch it down to water. It 
that's pretty uncharacteristic, I think, of a lot of handmade paints because a lot of handmade paints are from more, uh, from heavier pigments. So I'm going to show you one that doesn't do that. This gold ochre just kind of goes where you put it. So every pigment is going to have a different quality to it. Um, and some of them burst out like this purple does and others are going to stay put. The, the turquoise that we have here is a very, very hard pan of paint. It does not feel like any of the other pans here. It takes a little bit more coaxing to get any amount of pigment off, but it is a very beautiful color. And I want to try and show you more of that shelf-like quality. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like if you were looking at the side of a rock formation and it has the different layers of sediment build up. My video camera wasn't picking up the texture I was hoping to show you, so I took some pictures of some tests I did the night before on Canson XL paper. The first one is by itself, and the second one is mixed with the Poulet Purple. Overall, I was really happy with the quality of these paints. I think they're really fun to work with and a nice challenge for uh, artists who are looking for something a little bit different. They do handle a lot differently than traditional watercolor pigments, so learning the characteristics is really fun and different. I think the paints do best when they're allowed to shine on their own. I prefer using them as their single pigments out of the containers versus trying to mix them. The natural tones do mix a little bit better than some of the other colors. How I decided what I wanted to paint for this video with a little lilac breasted roller was I, I let the paints talk to me. They reminded me so much of when I was in Africa and saw these birds flying around and on the trees. So. Um, I'm going to let them continue to inspire me out in nature and take them traveling and see what I can come up with. I want to thank Jen so much for sending these to me to review. I want to thank all of you for being here. And uh, if you liked what you saw today, please head over to PfeifferArtSupply.com or her Etsy shop to go ahead and purchase a kit of your own. Thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to come back on Friday for Color Spotlight.